So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to IPI's uh, virtual policy briefing today. My name is Tom Giovanetti. I'm the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation. We're a 34-year-old free market think tank based in Dallas, Texas. I'd like to welcome you all to our Zoom policy briefing today on intellectual property, the key to our innovation economy. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and I want to especially thank those of you who are who are our donors and supporters, or those of you who, when you registered, took advantage of the opportunity to make a donation. We appreciate that. It's your support that makes these events possible, as well as everything else that we do. And if you'd like to know more about becoming a part of IPI, I'm going to encourage you to contact Addie Crimmins, our Director of Development. Her email was on every piece, her email address was on every piece of e email communication you got from us regarding this event. And it's also on our website. So reach out to Addie and she would be more than happy to tell you about our giving society or about other ways that you can support IPI. Uh, we will take as many questions today as we can. Uh, if you will use the Q&A function down at the bottom menu bar of your Zoom window, that way we'll be able to organize questions and keep track of them and get to as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, we're really, really delighted today to have a wonderful panel to talk about the importance of intellectual property to our innovation economy. Intellectual property is one of the five or six key policy areas that we concentrate on here at the Institute for Policy Innovation. Uh, without trying to steal anybody's thunder, uh, we believe that, that inventions and creativity are the basis of our economy. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to sell a product, it's hard to sell a service when it's not been invented yet or created yet. We think human beings are inherently creative. Human beings are inherently inventive. And that's one of the ways that we express our humanity is through our creativity and our inventiveness. And one of the great things about the U.S. is that from our earliest days, uh, we had intellectual property protection as one of our key constitutional rights and key constitutional protections. We're also delighted to have Bartlett Clellan, our senior research fellow here in our office today to moderate things. And Bartlett, as I said to you yesterday, a senior is not intended as a reflection of age. OK, it's a reflection of your longstanding relationship with us here. So please don't be insulted to be called a senior research fellow. Uh, Bartlett has been with us here at IPI for many years. We're delighted to have him with us here today. And with that, Bartlett, I'll turn things over to you to run things. Thank you, Tom. It has nothing to do with age. It just has to do with being around for a really, really long time, which makes me old anyway. So anyway, thank you, Tom. Um, and thank you to IPI for uh, giving us a platform to put this panel together. So uh, Tom already mentioned it's a great panel. Um, I say this all the time and I, I mean it every time. I love doing panels because I get to get together with old friends and then meet new friends. Um, and I, uh, I just love the social interaction, even if we can't be in the same space at the same time for now, um, we will be. And um, I'll look forward to uh, lunch or drinks with all of you um, again, one time, someplace um, in non-COVID world. So today we get together to uh, discuss how intellectual property protection is the key to our innovation economy. Uh, I, that, that stipulates for the record uh, for the moment that we do have an innovation grounded economy. I think that will become abundantly clear as we go through today. Um, and if not, uh, certainly check out IPI's website. Uh, you can find all kinds of economic and innovation minded writing and points that, uh, that, that will make it clear to you how much we do live in an innovation economy. We're gonna have time later for your questions. So make sure to start coming up with those um, even now, but hold them until about quarter of the hour and we'll get to those questions. Let me get to our panel. First of all, I have Amy Boss, a new friend uh, of mine. Uh, and so nice to meet you, Amy, and nice to see you here on Zoom. She's the Director of Federal Government Affairs with the Internet Association. Amy educates lawmakers on key issues facing internet companies and advocates for policies that facilitate the continued growth of a free and open internet, very much like IPI advocating for a free and open U.S. economy. She spent much of her career on Capitol Hill as the legislative director for Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. Next is Greg Safir, a longtime personal friend, so thank you, Greg, but also a longtime friend of IPI's. He is a senior vice president of external affairs at the Motion Picture Association, where he oversees the association's outreach to third-party stakeholders. In this role, he educates diverse communities about the creative industries and policy frameworks that support storytellers. 
Greg also serves on the board of directors of the Copyright Alliance and is an American Council of Young Political Leaders alumnus. And finally is Professor Adam Mossoff. I have to do that because I will never have law school out of my blood. So Professor, uh, he is a professor of law at Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. He is also chair of the Forum for IP at the Hudson Institute, where he is a senior fellow, and he is a board member of the Center for Intellectual Property Understanding. His research has been relied on by the Supreme Court, by the Federal Circuit, and by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, also known as the PTO. <clears throat> he has been invited five times to testify before Congress on patent policy and their proposed legislation. Uh, I should have mentioned also Adam is also a longtime friend of IPIs, and I know Adam via work here at IPI. And then finally, uh, you guys have all seen, but uh, just uh, in a little different role today, Tom Giovanetti, President of IPI, will be jumping in for some commentary along the way. So, all right, let's get started. The United States is where things are created. There is virtually no doubt uh, where they're created, designed, or invented, um, but not necessarily always where things are made. That has become abundantly clear in the last uh, year or two, but certainly in the supply chain discussion. But uh, look no further than computer chips and that whole story is played out in spades. And while it may be time to bring some of that manufacturing back home, our international competitive advantage is and will likely to remain, hopefully forever, our creativity and invention. The way we encourage and incentivize and protect that creativity is through our system of intellectual property. That's copyrights, patents, trademarks, and trade secrets. That's a legal regime, uh, but there are certainly under, underlying and undergirding economic arguments for that legal regime as well. Intellectual property is how we assure creators and inventors that if their creation succeeds in the marketplace, they are able to benefit, they're able to profit from it and exert control over that which they have created, invented, or otherwise been, been part of. IP, IP protection also involves making sure counterfeiting and piracy of protected goods is resisted, if not outright, um, uh, full on discouraged, but certainly rather than encouraged. So for proponents of free markets, Property rights are fundamental, hence they're fundamental to the Institute for Policy Innovation, and intellectual property rights are no different. So we decided uh, amongst ourselves before we started that we were going to give three or four minutes to each panelist to kind of give everyone a lay of the land, um, as it were, at 10,000 foot of their perspective of where we are with intellectual property rights. And because um, she's my newest friend, um, I'll go to Amy first. Thank you again, Amy, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Bart. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to join. Uh, a little bit about IA. So IA represents over 40 leading internet companies of all sizes, small, medium, and large. Um, our members are constantly inventing new products and services, and they rely on a strong intellectual property system, including copyrights, patents, uh, to drive this innovation. Important principles like fair use and intermediary liability protections deliver services that consumers love. This includes online streaming, curated music playlists, and reaction gifts. As you mentioned, IP protection involves making sure efforts are being taken to combat counterfeit and stolen goods. Many, many of our member companies, they offer online marketplaces, which really are at the forefront of these efforts. They're taking a number of meaningful actions to better protect consumers and enable brands to protect their intellectual property rights. Our member companies have implemented proactive policies, often going well above what the law requires of them. And they've partnered with law enforcement, retailers, brand owners, and have created some really, really innovative reporting and prevention tools that allow them and allow third parties to identify and remove counterfeit items in a timely manner. I'll say the vast majority of online sellers and goods sold online are legitimate, and they've really been a lifeline during this time of COVID. Um, but a small number of bad actors certainly are at times successful. Uh, no one benefits when counterfeit or stolen goods are sold online, not consumers, not online marketplaces or their users, and not trademark owners. It's a difficult job, we'll be honest. The sheer volume and growth of the internet makes, uh, makes this a very challenging, uh, challenging issue. But um, as I'll be dis discussing, we strongly believe that our members are on the right path to addressing these challenges. So thanks again for having me. Looking forward to your questions and, the, and a discussion. 
what an incredible point. And I think one that's often missed is the, the rapid growth. We all appreciate having commerce online. Um, and frankly, if you didn't appreciate it before, and I think most people did, but if you didn't, you certainly appreciate it in the world of COVID. Um, and uh, some companies have done very well in their supply chain. Uh, but yet, at the same time, with the rapid growth, and you think about these companies as tech companies, and yet there they are also the, the victim um, of this rapid growth. Uh, that, that's actually, I'm going to spend some time thinking on that point. That's great. All right, uh, Greg, let's go over to you next. Thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks, Tom and IPI, for, for hosting this important event about the link between IP and innovation. And uh, before I get started, I, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge you guys and um, the work that you've done over the years. Um, you guys have been you know, incredibly strong champions of, of strong IP rights and have really become our, our respected organization and uh, respected thought leaders in the IP space, not only um, um, helping educate lawmakers and, and, and policymakers and others about um, the legal framework, um, but demonstrating how they promote creativity and innovation and economic prosperity and, you know, all the important things that flow from a, from a strong, innovative and, and creative economy. So thanks again uh, to IPI and Tom and Bart in particular for all the great work you do. As you said, uh, my name is uh, Greg Safier. I work at the Motion Picture Association and uh, we are the primary voice for the film, television and streaming industry here in Washington and around the world. And uh, we represent um, some of the leading uh, creative companies in the world. And these are um, um, companies that many of you recognize, Disney, Warner Brothers, Paramount, Netflix, NBC Universal, and Sony Pictures Entertainment. And, um, you know, it's, it's a great industry to work for and, and a real um, IP success story. And, um, you know, one of the things I love about my job is that, you know, on top of um, representing storytellers in the storytelling industry, um, we have a really great story to tell on their behalf. And just to give you uh, a little bit of a sense of, of, of what our industry looks like, um, we support two and a half million jobs in all 50 states across the country. Uh, we pay out uh, 188 billion in, in total wages. And the industry is really uh, a network of, of small businesses, um, 93,000 of them in fact, 87% um, of which uh, employ uh, fewer than 10 people. We're also a huge export industry, uh, generating 17.3 billion in total exports and uh, a $9.6 billion trade surplus. And you know, with that kind of framework, just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of, of what we do every day, um, there are really four things we spend all of our time advocating on. Free speech, you can't have a thriving creative economy if storytellers don't have the ability to tell stories of their choosing in a daring, uh, provocative stories protected by free speech uh, uh, that they wanna share with the world and share with audiences. Free trade, I mentioned earlier that we're, you know, we're a huge export industry, global industry, we spend a lot of time uh, working with the US government and, and other governments and trying to, uh, to open markets to US creators and, and, and US creative companies. Strong property rights, which of course is the focus of our um, um, discussion today. Um, you know, creators can't make a living and careers out of telling their stories and sharing them with the world if they're not um, able to control how those stories are distributed and shared with audiences and monetized uh, uh, in order to support their families and, and, and again, make careers. And then of course, you know, as a, a corporate trade association, we work on general business issues like tax and, um, um, and other things like that. So um, really glad to be here. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation. And again, for all the work that you guys do at IPI and, and I'll stop there and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you for those kind words at the top of your comments there, uh, Greg. I, I, I appreciate them. I know Tom does. I know everyone involved with IPI does. Um, and it's really great when uh, people out there, people who are interested in this space, note the work of a think tank. That doesn't always happen, as you know. And, it, and as, as like as not, they may, they may hate it. So it's always nice to have the compliment. Um, and I, I just want to say that I think of your industry, uh, and I'm, I'm still in this mindset that Amy kind of blends here for me, you know, this rapid growth, the storytelling needs during uh, the pandemic um, were, were high. 
Um, and thank goodness there were great storytellers out there and a great system to deliver those stories in a way that storytellers felt comfortable having their stories delivered. So uh, we'll get more into that later, but uh, and that's where my head is at the moment. So, um, so we've heard a couple different takes on portions of intellectual property. Um, Adam, I know you come from our professor. Uh, I know you come from a, uh, a slightly different place in intellectual property, not in not in theory and approach, so to speak, but uh, from a different slice of the IP world. So let me uh, turn to you to fill us in on, on what we haven't gotten to yet. All right, well, uh, thank you, Bartlett. And I just wanna incorporate by reference Greg's great remarks about the, the, the work that you and, and, and Tom and, and your colleagues at IPI have done um, <clears throat> uh, on behalf of uh, free society, of free market and uh, the foundations of a flourishing uh, economy. Um, and so, and I'm delighted to be part of this discussion. Um, and as a professor, you know, I appreciated that Barlow said that we're going to provide, you know, 10,000 foot perspective. That's still a little too close down to earth for me as a professor. I prefer 30 or 40,000 foot, uh, more, more like the stratosphere, <laughs> a little higher, maybe even. Um, so I, in my opening remarks, I'm going to just very quickly kind of, I think, frame some context for us to get drilled down into some of the kind of current kind of hot topic debates. I, intellectual property, of course, today, patents on vaccines and trade secrets and, and, and copyrights and creative works and other things are very controversial for a lot of people in our, in, in our mobile revolution and in our, in, our, in our global economy. And they've always been controversial, but intellectual property has also been a key part of American exceptionalism. The United States was actually an innovator. The founders were innovators themselves uh, in actually for the very first time putting intellectual property into the US constitution, the very first time that that had been done and, um, and recognizing and institutionalizing the protection of intellectual property as property rights, as opposed to these kind of special privilege grants from the crown or from the government. And, and as a platform for uh, commercial activities and, and creative work and innovative work that property rights have served generally in all types of assets, property rights and new inventions and new artistic works and business uh, plans and models and things of the sort and trade secrets, patents, copyrights and others serve the foundation as a driver of the industrial revolution. And we learn the names of all of the great patent owners uh, in school from Samuel Morse and the Telegraph to Charles Goodyear to Isaac Singer and Elias Howe for the sewing machine to uh, Th Thomas Edison and Nicholas Tesla, who, who didn't manufacture anything. He just patented and licensed his technologies. Um, and this drove the, the, the entire industrial revolution in the 19th century. It's why it shifted from England to the United States um, in the 19th century, from the 18th century to the 19th century. And it continued to drive the great revolutions of the 20th century that drove our innovation economy and created a flourishing society. It drove the biomedical revolution in the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> And it drove the, uh, the digital and technological revolution in the 20th century, and it continued to serve as the basis for our mobile revolution today with our smartphones and our tablets. And in fact, that is the most patent intensive sector of the entire U.S. innovation economy is the smartphone industry. And yet we have massive innovation, some of the fastest uh, innovate, uh, technological growth with some of the greatest actual qual, if you hold constant for quality, uh, some of the fastest price drops um, that we've ever seen in any other sector of the economy. Um, thanks to the member companies that Amy uh, works with and, uh, and thanks to also uh, the, you know, the work, the great work of the creative industries and in deploying the, the important creative content that people consume on their mobile devices. So um, this is all part and parcel of what has made our economy incredibly successful. And even though it's controversial today in many areas of our lives and in many areas of our economy, I think that we should always remain committed to the foundational principle that property rights are, are a key as Tom and Greg and others have said, to successful flourishing economies and flourishing societies. And this certainly includes intellectual property as economists and historians have repeatedly recognized with overwhelming evidence um, over the past two centuries. Thank you. Almost forgot where my own mute button was. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm gonna come right back to you uh, because I do have a uh, questions for people, but I first want to remind those who are listening, um, I've got a couple questions here. Uh, we're going to have some uh, chat and everyone should feel free to jump in on these. Um, just keep your, amongst the us, uh, keep your responses short and pithy so that we have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Um, but let's, uh, or so I should say, let's kick that off. And again, Adam, will stick with you. So uh, I, I'm actually 
kind of surprised uh, by this, but as you highlighted for me, um, and as I uh, looked up independently, uh, we've kind of heard, uh, I'll, it's probably an overstatement, but I'll say a parade of complaints about the patent system lately. There's always some complaints out there, right? Like no one's ever happy completely with the system, but these are more meta complaints, I guess I would say. Complaints that take shots at the entire uh, patent system, and I would argue even the undergirding belief of the value of intellectual property. And so I'm just going to name a couple. Uh, but there, there are likely more, but these are the ones that jumped out at me uh, for various reasons. But Senator Patrick Leahy has stated that improperly grant, pat, granted patents um, are a cause of the high drug prices. We have the Biden administration uh, claims that uh, patent protections must be waived along a similar line here uh, on COVID-19 vaccines that argue, and, and arguing that these and other IP rights are preventing uh, both mass manufacture of vaccines and equitable distribution around the world. It, it does make one wonder, do we still have a, a great patent system in this country? Um, do patents and other IP rights, are they a, a block um, for innovation, or you know, as we've been asserting, are they actually facilitating uh, that and economic growth? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and there's a lot of misunderstandings about the function and role of, of property rights in new technological innovations like drugs, and even in the technological innovations in the high tech sector. Um, and <clears throat> um, and it's unfortunate. I mean, controversies around the patent system have existed since since the patent system came into existence in 1790. And, um, and they continue to this day. And, you know, patents are always the easy go-to, uh, you know, uh, whipping boys, uh, you know, th th for any social ill that people want to complain about from high drug prices to other things. And so I, I actually want to just state as a matter of fact, uh, and this is undisputed, <laughs> that there is, uh, with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, there is zero evidence and I mean literally zero evidence that patents have blockaded the development, manufacturing, commercialization, or distribution of any vaccines or drugs. In fact, the evidence is all to the contrary, that they've actually facilitated all of these incredible treatments. In fact, the whole biomedical uh, response to COVID-19, which is unprecedented in, historical, in history, we've never had multiple vaccines developed, approved, and distributed to millions of people less than a year after the outbreak of a global pandemic. And by the end of 2021, uh, it, uh, that this industry will have manufactured or produced upwards of 12 billion doses of vaccines. <laughs> Remember, there's only 7 billion people who live on the planet. Um, and so, I mean, and this is all made possible because we had reliable and effective property rights secured to the innovators in the biopharmaceutical sector, who for decades investigated what was thought to be very long to be a very crazy idea, this mRNA platform. Um, and they received extensive private venture capital funding because they couldn't even get government funding for this thing because for these for this because it was thought to be so crazy at the time back in the 90s and as a, and as a result of this they were able to develop in in the biomedical sector an incredible infrastructure of knowledge of licensing agreements of, of information sharing agreements that are all the, on, done on the basis of these property rights which is what you would expect to see or happen in any industry in any sector of the economy where you have reliable and effective property rights in which people are transacting on the basis of those uh, property rights between them to to distribute, produce, and manufacture, and sell goods in, in, in the free market. Um, and so um, it, the exact same concerns and problems with rhetoric and not, not matching up with the facts in the drug pricing debate too. You know, there's lots of things that affect drug pricing um, from, you know, the massive uh, cross-subsidization that occurs under Obamacare to the FDA regulatory controls to the, you know, to insurance uh, regulations and things of this sort. And it's just very odd for all of a sudden people to fixate on patents as the sole cause of why uh, drugs might be, might be uh, expensive in some contexts, and which in fact they're not actually. Um, in fact, of the of you know of the uh, of the uh, core essential medicines identified by the World Health Organization, um, well over ninety five percent of them are all off patent. Um, and so you know people are you know when people talk about like well drugs are expensive. Well, they're talking about the new cutting edge drugs, the, you know the, the 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 incredible biotech innovations that we have. Well, yes, because 
those and you know those are the new innovations and but uh, up, up to $2.6 billion on average went into creating those over 10 to 15 years of, of, of R&D expenditures and research. And so they need to recoup that as any, as a, uh, a, as any uh, private investor would need to in order to continue to fund ongoing research and development of new products and services. And so it's just, you know, there's just that there's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of heat and very little light when it comes to issues like drug prices and the COVID-19 pandemic vis-a-vis uh, -vis the patent system. Um, and, and it's much better people stick to the facts and stick to understanding exactly how these things work, especially remembering the core foundational principles at the end of the day that property rights are facilitators of innovation and economic growth and the incredible products and services that make all of our lives veritable miracles by any historical standard today. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I love the way you frame up the, the whole um, undergirding part of this debate, because I do think that it may be in patents more than anywhere else. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure why this is. I think maybe because there are a bunch of patent lawyers. Um, by the way, for anyone, I, I am an attorney, so I'm taking a shot at my own kind. Um, but I, I, I don't know if that we get involved in these really picky and battles um, and, and not that they're unimportant. There's always an industry that is at the end of that battle, right? But sometimes the rhetoric gets a little crazy um, compared to those challenges. Um, it doesn't seem to happen as much in, in copyright uh, that they, 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 there seems to be a, a nearer connection between the debate and the undergirding principles that are there, it seems, um, as opposed in patents. So I really like that you framed it right from those principles uh, straight out. And speaking of copyright, uh, Greg, that is your domain uh, writ large. Um, and you certainly are no stranger to the, uh, the challenges of, of some of those same fights that uh, Adam was outlining, uh, just shifted over to copyright. Uh, but we also mentioned earlier uh, where we are at this point of history. Uh, and we mentioned the pandemic. And, you know, let's be honest here. I mentioned this earlier. A lot of people turn to entertainment, um, to stories, all kinds of stories, even stories uh, about uh, keepers of wild animals um, to entertain themselves during the pandemic. Um, and listen, whether we like those stories or not, a lot of them got a lot of attention. They got a lot of awards, for example. Um, and it was it was what people were doing to, to help them get through. So it has along those lines, a lot more people we know um, got online in, in however you define that. They got online in the first place, they bought various platform services um, to start accessing more and more content. So there's been a big shift to digital. It's been going on, but it really ramped up. So has that shift to digital impacted the role of IP in the creative economy? And more specifically, maybe, how has COVID impacted IP industries like the industries you talk about, which is film and television? Yeah, and uh, thanks for that, Bart. And it, you know, as you said, um, you know, the, the shift to digital in the in the creative industries has been underway for some time. But I mean, certainly, um, um, the COVID nineteen pandemic helped kind of supercharge um, um, that shift. And um, to your question about, you know, has it changed the role of IP in the uh, in the creative economy? I mean, the, the short answer is no. Um, in, in fact, if anything. Uh, it's only underscored the importance of IP um, to, uh, uh, to a thriving creative economy. And, you know, of course, as, as you alluded to in the, uh, in the video space, um, you know, we've seen the rapid deployment of innovating streaming services that are making films and shows available to consumers, um, you know, when and where they choose. And, you know, of course, alongside that, cable and satellite and broadcast uh, are also... Um, continuing to serve tens of, uh, of millions uh, of consumers as well. But just kind of t take a little bit of a step back because we're kind of in this midst of a revolution around distribution. And this isn't the first time this has happened in, in, in the creative industries, you know, from time to time, you know, new innovative distribution models come along um, and it's what excites everyone and everyone's talking about it. And you know, particularly here in Washington, one of the things that I, I, I've noticed over the years is that when it comes to debates and discussions around um, uh, creative community and industry issues, 
the conversations do always seem to center on distribution as opposed to the creation of the films and shows that of course everyone is clamoring to distribute. And what gets lost in that framing is um, just how challenging and risky and time consuming and complicated and expensive uh, creating uh, world-class films and shows uh, really is. And to um, kind of underscore that point, just consider this, right? Uh, eight in 10 movies will never recoup their initial investment at the box office. And of course that, you know, is, is pre-pandemic figures, right? I mean, it's, that's been thrown off um, even more. And then even after accounting for downstream revenue sources like cable and broadcast and satellite and streaming and, and, and other things, six in 10 films will never make a dime. So what I'm saying is that, you know, we're a hits driven industry and the hits pay for the flops and every bit of revenue matters as creators and creative companies are trying to soak up these losses um, um, through the films and shows that actually succeed in the marketplace. And so to kind of bring it back around, you know, to, to where we started with this, you know, incredible wave of um, creativity and innovation and investment and experimentation um, underway in our industry. Un unfortunately, piracy has remained uh, a persistent and growing problem. And, you know, just as legitimate creators and innovators are adopting streaming technologies and, and deploying these services, unfortunately, so too are bad actors. And, um, you know, for us, what that looks like is uh, a $29 billion loss to the economy, which comes from a, um, a report done by, uh, uh, by the chamber uh, a couple of years ago. And of course, it also impacts hundreds of thousands of jobs and um, uh, affects consumers as well. Uh, there's a growing body of research um, about the link between privacy sites and malware and scams and other malicious content um, um, that, you know, films and shows are used as bait to distribute um, to consumers by bad actors. So, um, you know, we've done a lot uh, ourselves to try and address piracy over the last decade. We've done that through um, a combination of um, voluntary initiatives uh, with good faith, uh, good faith stakeholders, including companies like Google and Amazon and internet service providers and advertisers and others. And then, of course, you know, um, when necessary, we also bring civil enforcement actions against piracy sites themselves in court or um, uh, make criminal referrals to the Department of Justice um, um, to try and go back uh, after the bad actors um, in that regard. But, you know, all, all of those efforts combined still leaves a large class of um, commercial scale piracy efforts um, out of reach. And so we're constantly, you know, working with um, uh, whether it's companies in the private sector, um, other industry organizations, government, to look for ways to try and limit piracy, particularly when we're in this you know, dramatic period of, of, of innovation and change where um, there's no reason why we should be allowing piracy to stand, uh, stand in the way, of, the way of that. And um, just to kind of flip over to the, the, the second part of your question, which is you, you know, how has COVID impacted our industry? Um, I mean, it'll come as no surprise to this audience and uh, really anyone else that it's, it's been a huge challenge. And uh, our industry was one of, one of the hardest hit. And, um, you know, not only were theaters closed around the world, but um, production ground to a halt. And, you know, MTA spent, you know, much of um, the first year of the, of the pandemic and lockdowns, you know, working with our partners um, um, uh, in labor, as well as state and local governments on return to work issues, things like, you know, what does the safe set look like? Um, and, you know, we also spent a lot of time working with the federal government on, on, on aid to the theatrical sector and, of course, the creative industry uh, workers, too, you know, just like in every other sector of the economy. You know, a lot of people were, were out of work and, and struggling. Um, and, you know, you kind of touched on this at the beginning, Bart, you know, I mean, this, it's, it's COVID is kind of the gift that keeps on giving, right? You know, every time we seem to be returning to some semblance of normalcy, some new surge is reported or a new variant comes out and that continues uh, to put downward pressure 
uh, uh, on the industry and, and, and add to the complication that in the risky kind of environment that I, that I described earlier in, in, in any creative endeavor. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's been a real challenge. Um, you know, piracy too has, has continued to, to, to be, you know, just as it's related to COVID to be, to be something we're dealing with. Um, in particular, when the, when, the, when the pandemic first started, there was a unsurprising kind of big spike in the first several weeks um, as people were on lockdown orders and, um, um, and looking to consume entertainment. And unfortunately, we're finding it through um, through legal means. And then of course, you know, um, um, as creative companies are experimenting with, um, you know, new release strategies, um, whether it's uh, uh, making films available the same day that they're uh, available in theaters or in shorter windows than perhaps they, 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 they used to be, um, perfect digital copies of, of films and shows just show up online even, even sooner. Um, um, making it more difficult for them to thrive and recoup their investment in the legitimate marketplace. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot to unpack there, obviously, and, um, and uh, really kind of interesting and exciting time, but, you know, challenges remain uh, um, as well. But my, my guess is that, uh, well, I, I'm going to speak for myself. How about that? Um, it is amazing how much something like COVID comes along. I, I guarantee you, I didn't give one moment of thought to what would happen um, if all of a sudden there was a, a, a pandemic or anything like that in this country where IP is concerned. Other things may have crossed, you know, what if uh, power has gone out in various parts of the country? You think about what if there's no electricity? What if there's a gas shortage? Like those are things we've thought about. Um, and it, I, in none of those did IP seem to be a big deal, but here we were sitting in our homes and the only thing, uh, or one of the couple things we could do, one was to enjoy some kind of IP in a very direct way. So using the patent system, technology is built on it and receiving copyrighted material into our homes. Uh, but the other way was to be uh, that people spent a lot of time and continues to be part of the part of the reason that we have the supply chain challenges we have was uh, lots of consumers uh, buying things online as well. So Amy, let's get you back in the fray here. Um, thank you for starting and and uh, and then being quiet for the last long time. Sorry about that. So um, the importance of IP has been underscored as we've talked about over and over uh, during the pandemic. And we did have a record number of consumers getting onto online platforms uh, for their goods and services during all that. Uh, oh, and if they weren't already doing it, uh, figuring out new ways, both from the service provider and the goods provider, so that th these industries could somehow uh, stumble forward until they could get their legs under them. Uh, what new trends have your members, uh, and, and who are a number of uh, some of your members, are a number of online marketplaces such as eBay or Etsy um, or Amazon, all of which I use, um, but what did they notice during COVID? What interest do these online platforms have in the promoting and facilitating of the IP? And I've kind of tipped my hand at that as I explained how it all works. But can you give us a couple examples of what your member companies are doing uh, to make sure that they are combating or doing what they can do to make combating infringement a priority? Sure. Thank you for that. Um, I think as far as trends, so as Greg mentioned, obviously the shift to online goods and services has been taking place for a, a while. Um, but in 2020, it was just such a massive increase. Over 2 billion people purchased goods and services online. Um, E-retail sales surpassed 4.2 trillion U.S. dollars. Um, and also you have people who want to turn extra income or who may have lost a job and had to find other streams. Um, so I'm thinking of a platform like Etsy, where individuals started selling goods and services um, there to earn extra income. And 90% of Etsy sellers, they operate from their home. They are not um, well-versed in IP law. And so a lot of our member companies have had to educate them on you know, what products are legitimate, what they can and cannot sell, which has been a little bit of an, of an interesting issue for them. Um, I will mention, you know, right when the pandemic hit too, um, on many of our platforms, you all of a sudden saw a bunch of pandemic scams pop up. You saw fraudulent COVID-19 vaccines and cures, fake websites claiming to provide customers with pandemic essentials, 
fake COVID vaccine cards. Um, our members have had to act really quickly and remove uh, specific products that, um, you know, weren't thought about, you know, a, a couple years ago, and also have had to educate buyers and issue warnings for them. Um, as far as some specific examples from what our member companies are doing to make uh, IP um, a priority, um, a number of things. So, so first online platforms, um, they vet sellers up front through direct and indirect means. They use advanced tools like image detection and machine learning. Um, one program I specifically wanted to mention, so in 2017, Amazon launched Brand Registry. It's a free services service that gives rights holders advanced tools to protect their brands. We have close to 150,000 brands around the world that use this registry, and they're finding and reporting 99% fewer sus suspected infringements than before their launch. Um, Amazon also established a counterfeit crimes unit made up of former federal prosecutors. Um, eBay has created, uh, it's called the Vero program to protect intellectual property owners. They register with this program. They are alerted to of in, infringement threats. eBay investigates um, the issue and notifies the seller um, via email that a Vero participant requested that their listing be removed. The listing um, remains suspended unless and until a settlement is reached. Um, I mentioned a little bit about ed educating sellers in terms of what is appropriate um, ways to sell their items. Um, Etsy is doing an amazing job doing the uh, doing this and, and educating people to understand kind of the intricacies of IP laws. Um, so this is just some of the some of the examples. Um, uh, some of the examples. Many other platforms have have used similar similar tools as well. And I think just um, to your question of why do online pl platforms have an interest in promoting and facilitating IP protection? I think it comes down to an issue of trust. Um, online platforms rely on consumers coming back. If I have a bad experience on one platform, I'm gonna take my business elsewhere. So I, I think there's this vested interest in ensuring that their products are, um, are legitimate and complying with, law, with federal law. Um, so along with pursuing their own initiatives, um, they've collaborated, collaborated directly with brand owners. Um, our member companies rely on these partnerships because trademark holders are really in the best position to know when a good is fake or infringes on their rights based on the quality, design, and product specifications. The tricky thing is that online platforms may never possess the counterfeit good and cannot examine um, for signs of counterfeiting, even if they know what to look for. Um, further, online platforms and marketplaces may not know whether brand owners have authorized third-party sellers. So for these reasons, um, our members pride themselves on cooperating with brand owners, with law enforcement, um, to mitigate the threats of counterfeit listings. <clears throat> Interesting to me, and I, this thought has been around for a long time, but it clearly we are it, it seems that we're developing kind of the, the way to act online and the way not to act online. And by doing all these positive things, you kind of define yourself into the good citizen uh, category and thereby highlighting for the others. So uh, that's uh, fantastic to hear. Always interesting from an innovation angle, big innovation happening, right? Uh, the creation of these places, but then uh, other innovations that feed that as time goes on, figuring out how to make it work correctly. And I've got to say, I love the education side. I can't even, I honestly was sitting here laughing. I can't even imagine trying to explain to my mom who does crafts, right? And she decides she wants to sell them on Etsy, like the intricacies of IP law, that would be entertaining. In fact, I might actually pay for that. And I love you, mom, I love you. But um, IP law, not her strong suit, be fun. All right, Tom, I know you have uh, tons of thoughts in these areas. Um, so I'll ask you to corral those to like maybe four minutes. Um, but, uh, and, and I know you can speak uh, in depth on virtually any of the stuff that's brought up, but let me come to you for any comments you want to make before we get to audience questions. Yeah, I just want to kind of make an observation and then, and then let, let the panelists respond to it. Um, I'm struck by the degree to which the creative industries have actually come through on their promises and commitments, and aren't we glad they did? And, and I think about, for instance, um, you know, the patent industry basically says, allow us to protect our property, 
and we'll go out and find the funding we need to do the innovation we want to do. We won't depend on the government and we'll be a, we'll be a strong creative industry and we'll be robust and resilient and we will on the regular on a regular schedule deliver innovations. And so when a pandemic comes along, isn't it fabulous that we didn't really have to create anything from scratch? Isn't it fabulous that as slow as Congress can move on things, we weren't the, the, you know, the innovation was not dependent on government. Now government certainly did some things to facilitate it, but we had robust, well-funded biotech and pharmaceutical companies that could move on a dime because of the fact that that they what they've basically said is give us predictable legal regime, give us the ability to to uh, to raise capital, give us strong property right. Although I know that Adam would say that Congress has or the Supreme Court has sort of eroded that a little bit over the last few years. But the, 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 the patent industries have delivered on those promises and they came through for us. And aren't we glad that they did? I think about the music and the movie industry, which a number of years ago was basically saying, look, give us the ability to protect our content and we will make it easily available in digital form. Uh, help us stop piracy. Uh, Give us the legal regime that we need to do that, and we'll deliver. And they did. And when it, wh whether it's the easy availability of music now from multiple streaming services, basically, you know, almost every song ever recorded, you can have immediate access to at the touch of a finger. When I think about all these streaming services, is it, Greg, isn't it an amazing bit of timing that all of these studios got their digital streaming services up and running just before the pandemic hit? Uh, I mean, really remarkable. Um, but that those into the music and the uh, movie and TV industries, they delivered on their promise. They said, if you'll allow us protection regimes, if you'll allow us technical protection measures, if you will allow us to do these things, we will make our content easily available to people. And they did. And I think about Amy's companies who basically said, Give us what we need structurally. Give us digital signatures and things like that. Give us a light touch regulatory regime. Don't tax us to death and we'll deliver innovation on a regular basis and we will we will deliver services to consumers that they never even dreamed of. And they really did. So I'm just really sort of struck by the degree to which the creative industries have actually lived up to their promises and representations. And it is a testament to, the, I think, the good job in general that policymakers in the U.S. have made in all of these areas. That's that's why we have that level of success. Hey, Greg. Well, maybe maybe I'll start. And you know, thank you for that, Tom. And and and, and I think you're right in that. Um, you know, look, a, a stable legal framework that really incentivizes, protects, and and and, and promotes. The ability for creators uh, and innovators to take take risks um, in the marketplace um, is fundamental to a well, and, and, and specifically, Greg, uh, piracy folks used to use as their excuse, "Well, this content is not easily available." And if the stu if the studios would make it available, that would be different. Well, you did, you know. Yeah, and then, yes, and then yes. we found out that was not the justification after all, right? But I mean. You know, I, I just think that's that's a good example of the fact that uh, the industries have delivered on their promises. Yeah, and it, it, you're exactly right. And you know, we we frustratingly kind of labored under the assertion that you're that you're articulating there that you know essentially it was you know it's it's the creative industry's own fault that people are pirating stuff because they're not making it available online in an easily accessible, you know, consumer friendly way. Um, and you know, creative companies and creative industries have gone to gone through incredible transformations um, to meet consumer demand and, and find audiences where they are and where and, and where they want to be. And you know, I was kind of alluding to it earlier. You know, one of the big disappointments I think for, for our, our industry is that piracy remains persistent, um, and and if anything, has has just grown far more sophisticated. Um, you know. In, in, in earlier days, uh, consumers would have to go through um, kind of complicated technical protocols, whether P2P file sharing or other things um, in order to access the legal um, copies of, uh, of creative works. I, I mean, in today's world, you have um, piracy site operators that are 
essentially digital versions of Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu or Peacock or this and that, and um, are, are incredibly slick and sophisticated and um, don't take any real technical know-how um, um, in, in, in how to use them and uh, represent you know, a, real, a, a real threat. And on top of that, there it's an incredibly lucrative business in that, of course, they don't pay for the product that they're selling or any of the, input, the inputs into the services that they're offering. So, you know, a combination of, um, uh, you know, readily available um, online in anonymity tools and a lack of effective enforcement mechanisms coupled with a real profit motive um, in that you can make um, millions and millions of dollars um, means that uh, piracy sites and sophisticated piracy sites and services are flourishing. Thank you. Anyone else? To, want to jump in on? on Tom's thoughts. If not, I'm going to go to some. It looks like we have three uh, patent questions. So uh, I'll ask folks if anyone else has questions to load those up as well so I can uh, skip around a little bit. But um, Amy, Professor, you guys want to jump in? The only other thing I'll, I'll add is, you know, I, I mentioned a number of policies and procedures that a lot of our member companies are taking. Um, you know, this isn't prescriptive. This isn't coming out of Washington, D.C. It's not coming from Congress. Um, our companies uh, rely on the flexibility to to act quickly. Who could have predicted that uh, 2020 we'd have this global pandemic? And so, um, you know, the programs I mentioned um, were, were voluntary because our companies have a vested interest um, in their business model. All right. Okay. Let me take a look at the questions. I have one. Um, I'm going to uh, pick up on Greg's point about uh, piracy um, and do the analog on the patent side. And that is patent infringement maybe is one of the other there are all kinds of analogies here, but people skirting the legal system for IP and taking value that, uh, that isn't theirs. How about that? So um, the question comes from Mark Zashin, uh, and it is, is there an increase in patent infringement and are legal laws up to date or behind the times? And that a little bit goes, uh, Adam, to my question about, do we really still have a global gold standard? But why don't you go ahead and take a shot at that one? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, it's, it's hard to actually identify, um, you know, in, 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 whether there's more infringement now than there has been in previous years, um, because it's always what's your baseline um, and what type of infringement are you talking about? Commercial infringement, individual infringement. So, you know, the, and, and infringers always change, like there were the piracy websites that Greg was talking about didn't exist uh, 10 years ago. So, um, you know, how do you classify or categorize that compared to what came before? So, um, but, the, but the concern with infringement today in the patent space is that there has arisen uh, a phenomenon of predatory infringement where kind of large, well-capitalized companies now take advantage of um, many um, legal changes that Tom alluded to by the Supreme Court, institutional changes like the creation of the PTAB, a, a tribunal at the patent office whose sole job is to cancel patents. Um, and so it's, you know, it, and you can file as many petitions as you want there. So patent owners sometimes have 30, 40 petitions filed against their patents when they sue someone for infringement. And that has to be resolved before they can proceed with their infringement trial. And so massive amounts of costs are now imposed upon innovators because there were some bad actors. There's, you know, that, that's undeniable. There were, you know, a few bad actors. There was no actual evidence of systemic problem, but there were a few bad actors that were highlighted for rhetorical and policy purposes and, the, and, and, and for the purposes of, of, of certain large companies that wish to have access to patented innovations and copyrighted creativity. And as a result of that, we, we, there's a lot of concern now that we have, in fact, lost our gold standard patent system, that the kind of the reliable and effective property rights that have been secured to even the biopharmaceutical innovators, you know, 10, 15 years ago when they were creating the mRNA platform, for instance, that led to the, you know, the, these incredible vaccines, 
um, no longer exists for them, and it no longer exists for creators and innovators um, <clears throat> in the high tech space, for instance, the people who create some of the foundational te technologies like 4G and 5G and Wi-Fi and things of that sort, which are technologies that do take billions of dollars and you know, decades of investments and of, and of labor to produce, and and are therefore and are and are distributed commercially through a licensing business model in which you have to have reliable and effective patent rights backed by injunctive injunctions and the ability to get full damages for when your rights are violated, and those are no longer really available. Um, and this is why there's a, a, a tremendous amount of discussion, both in Capitol Hill, bipartisan discussion between Senator Tillis and Senator Coons to reform the PTAB, to bring back, you know, injunctive remedies and things of the sort, um, and, uh, and to reform other uh, aspects of the patent system that have been changed by the Supreme Court in the past 10 years. And this, to take it back to our gold standard system, the system that facilitated the industrial revolution, the system that facilitated the biopharmaceutical revolution and the tech revolution and the mobile revolution we have today, um, that, you know, because the problem is, is that when you make these changes, it doesn't impact the technology or the, or the medicines that we get tomorrow because that's not how the patent system works. The patent system works on the, for the investments for the technologies and products and services that will be developed and commercialized 10 years from now. So, and those are now potentially no longer being created. Um, and in fact, a lot of people are reporting that they're no longer investing in uh, certain foundational technologies or biopharmaceutical uh, innovations. And so we will experience the uh, potentially the ill effects of these changes and the loss of our gold center patent system you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, um, because we're living off of now the benefits of the rights that had existed 15 or 20 years ago. Well, I want to say no hour goes faster than when I'm talking policy and uh, intellectual property for that matter. I suspect anyone who's on here um, agrees, uh, but I have, uh, because of schedules, I have a keen eye to, that we're about two or three minutes till three o'clock. So let me do this real quick. Um, I fundamentally believe that anybody who works in the IP space, because of our focus on innovation and creation, we're kind of inherently optimistic people. Um, and so what I'd like to do, and with the holidays on now, I'd love to come to each of you for your optimistic forecast in your space uh, and take maybe 60 seconds. Greg, let me go oh, and then wrap that up with how do people find out more about what you've been talking about? Uh, how do they reach you if you'd like to do that? So Greg, let me come to you first. What's your kind of optimistic take on, on where things are, um, noting that there are challenges, but uh, for the future, and then how do people get hold of you or find out more? So, so my optimistic take is going to uh, maybe go in a slightly different direction than, than, than you may be expecting in that um, while all the rage and all the discussion in the creative industries is about streaming and, and digital distribution and, and, and this and that, um, um, I'm hoping and, and making my bold or uh, uh, optimistic prediction that theatrical uh, uh, will continue to play an important role in our industry, not just for the communal experience that it provides and the kind of you know destination family night out type thing, but also because theatrical serves as such an important anchor for creating cultural awareness and excitement about, uh, uh, about films and about stories um, um, in a way that digital, at least to date, has, has struggled to do. So my optimistic prediction is that you know, no matter what happens with COVID, uh, theatrical is gonna continue to play an important role in our industry, um, and I'm looking forward to that. To learn more about um, uh, what you know, we talked about here, please go to uh, www.motionpictures.org. Uh, you can find all sorts of great resources about the industry, the issues we care about, um, as well as a great catalog of, of, of our own programming and panels and things like that. On, on issues that are similar to this and others. But thank you again, Bart, Tom, Adyai, and, and, and Adam and Amy. Thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, Professor, let's go to you next. Same, uh, same questions. Oh, it, well, uh, um, <laughs> I, I usually don't like to make predictions because um, especially as a professor. <laughs> well, just, just tell us something I mean, optimistic about the patent system. But yeah. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it, my whole, so I, I hope that 
the reform efforts that have been undertaken by people like Senator Tillis and Senator Coons um, start to you know produce some uh, some you know fruits of their labors in the in, in the year 2022, um, <clears throat> and that um, and that courts also start to and uh, start to you know return us back to the gold standard patent system that we would have. That would be kind of my hope. I don't know if that will come true, but that would be my optimistic hope um, in, in the spirit of the season. So. Oh, and for people who are interested in more, you can find my scholarship and my, I write many white papers on the, on IP waiver issues and on, and on drug pricing issues and things of that sort uh, through, uh, you know, through the Heritage Foundation, through Hudson and, um, <clears throat> and through many other organizations. Um, and you can find that easily just by Googling my name and patents for patent law. So uh, I will say Adam Mossoff, uh, for people who don't know, uh, he is eminently Googleable. So uh, you can find <laughs> his stuff in a lot of places very easily. Um, Amy, let's go to you for the same. And, and I should say, Amy, we've talked about a piece of the industry you represent, but you have a ton of members in a ton of spaces um, who are doing a ton of things. So let me, uh, you can pick whatever you'd like uh, for the, uh, for many of them, for the optimistic um, go forward for, for your areas, uh, but then also let us know how to find out more. Sure. Um, so I think I would just uh, give this message along. Obviously, holiday shopping is coming up. Our members offer a lot of diverse ways to shop online. Um, third party sellers um, have, have been a big benefit from this as well. Um, folks that sell products on eBay and Etsy, there are some very unique, unique and creative ideas. And so, um, you know, we we love the fact that, um, you know, people are turning to sort of some of these unique outlets to purchase uh, gifts and goods for their loved ones. Um, so you can learn more about um, a lot of our member companies and what in their online platforms at internetassociation.org. Um, we have a section on intellectual property rights and in a, in a section on what we are doing to combat counterfeit goods online as well. Fantastic. I'm, I'm going to give uh, mine and then Tom, I'm going to turn it back to you um, and would love if, if you gave your optimistic note. Thank you, Greg, for joining us and uh, good luck um, with your next your next appointment. Um, so my my prediction is that innovation will remain to be the undergirding part of the U.S. economy for as far as the eye can see. And while at times uh, people take shots at intellectual property, while at times people take shots at technology or um, patents specifically, et cetera, that at the end of the day, that they or enough others will come to their senses. And innovation will continue to be the hallmark of this economy and will continue to drive the global economy from this economy. Um, that's, that's not a next year prediction. So I'm going to go ahead and say that at least for the next 10 years, I'm right, but I suspect I'll be dead and in the grave a long time before I'm wrong. Uh, and so with that, I will say happy holidays. And I mean that because now there's so many holidays. I don't remember all of them to tell people, but whatever your faith tradition or not faith tradition, I'm there for you to have a great time at the end of this year as we go into next year. Um, with that, let me turn it over to you, Tom, and thank you for allowing us this opportunity to to all uh, do this here today. I've enjoyed Thanks. being in the office. Thanks so much, Bartlett. Uh, you know, I decided that my go-to answer on those kind of questions is short-term pessimistic, long-term optimistic. That just, it seems to always work for whatever, whatever the prediction, whatever the question. Uh, I, I wanna mention uh, in closing, uh, that if you have a particular interest in intellectual property, you can go to our website, you can sign up, you can check a box, you can indicate intellectual property as one of your interest areas, and you will go on our IP list and you'll be notified of anything that we have going on in the area of intellectual property. So I would suggest that you do that. Uh, I also want to mention that every year around April 26th, IPI hosts a World Intellectual Property Day event. Um, they're normally in, in person, live and in person in Washington, D.C., but for the last two years, they've been virtual. We are crossing our fingers that we'll be able to return to doing a live event in April in D.C. I'm not sure about that. I think D.C. will probably be the last place on Earth that allows the resumption of normal life. Uh, but one way or the other, we will be doing a World IP Day program on or about April 26th, so you might want to mark that on your calendar. This will be our last Zoom policy briefing of the year during the COVID pandemic. We've done over 40 uh, Zoom policy briefings, so we're probably among 
we're probably in the top 25% of Zoom's customers at this point. Um, but it's been a wonderful technology. We've been delighted to have it. I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us. I want to thank all of our panelists. And again, this will be archived on our website and on our YouTube channel so that you can share it with other people. And again, if you want to know more about IPI, contact Addie Crimmins, uh, Addie at IPI.org, and she will be delighted to uh, answer your questions and help you find out how you can get more involved with us. So with that, we'll bring things to a close. Thank you again to everyone, and we wish you happy and delightful holiday season. Thank you. Thank you.